Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. My name is Cecilia Montalban, and it's a real pleasure to be a part of the Global Biodiversity Festival this year. Today, I'm going to be talking about some of my favorite animals in the world that many people don't know much about, and how technology is helping us explore their world, even in the darkness. So my journey into becoming a bat biologist was pretty much entirely by chance. About five years ago, I helped out on a hibernation survey in Western England. And about halfway through, I came across this little horseshoe bat deep, deep inside the cave, like completely fast asleep and hibernating. And I just remember it was covered in some condensation and some frost from the extreme temperatures. And it just, it just hit me there and then that there was this whole world out there that I knew nothing about. I'd been fascinated by animals my entire life, but there was just something about this little creature about the size of my thumb and the fact that I just knew nothing about it. Why was it there? Why was it hibernating like in different groups with different species? There was just so much that I wanted to know. I remember people pointing at it and they knew what species it was um, and I was just completely hooked. So I'm from Peru. I grew up in Lima. Um, and after graduating high school, I moved to Canada, where I did my Bachelor of Science at the University of British Columbia. I then started working as a wildlife biologist for about three years, doing surveys for all kinds of protected species. And then I crossed over the big pond to the, to the United Kingdom. That bat encounter happened about four months after I moved, and it was a major switching point in my life. So for the past past five years, I've worked, volunteered, and researched bats extensively across the UK, across Europe, and further afield. And that eventually led me to go back to university, do my master's, and I wanted to basically learn how to do better science and how to research them in a way that would directly contribute to their conservation. So that's led me now to become a research assistant, and I'll be starting my PhD as well soon. I'm also an amateur photographer, so I think that one of the beauties of bats is really capturing their diversity around the world, um, where they roost and how they behave and all kinds of things, and really showing the fact that bats come in all shapes and colors. So just here on the slides, you can see a selection of bats from around the world. You've got proboscis bats in Peru. Um, these roost near, near rivers and water bodies, and they're perfectly camouflaged on trees, which is quite remarkable. We've got greater horseshoes that I photographed in, in a cave in Spain. Um, you in, a, in a leaf tent that we'll talk about a little bit more. And then as well, you've got large fruit bats in Kenya. So these are actually straw colored fruit bats. Um, and they are the mammals that undertake the largest mammal migration in the world. So over 10 million bats of this species come together in Kasanka National Park in Zambia every year from across Sub-Saharan Africa, which is amazing. You've got uh, Myotis Walwechi eye bat, um, which it's got these beautiful, beautiful wings of black and orange, and it's got freckles all over its skin. And it's just, it's something unreal when you see it. And finally, on the, on the bottom corner there, it's a bat that I photographed in Cuba. That's an Antillian ghost bat. It's endemic to the Caribbean islands, um, and it's just morphologically adapted to life in complete darkness. Now, this is just some of the, 1,400 species of bats that we know of, and we know that they are absolutely essential in ecosystems all across the world, as pest controllers, as pollinators, as seed dispersers, and all sorts. Many bats use caves, and photography can be a very useful tool for, for monitoring them. Um, you've got these greater mouse-eared bats in Romania that are in a cluster. You see massive hibernation colonies of species like these noctual bats also in Romania. Now, not all species of bats hibernate, but most do in the temperate regions of the world. For some species, you also get large maternity colonies. So that's when pregnant females, female bats come together, they roost together and they have their young in these large colonies and rear them up together. And often photos are taken of these large clusters so that we can then count the individual bats from the images. That allows us to look at population sizes over time, how they move and congregate within the cave, and all kinds of things that teach us a lot about the biology of these animals. When you see these carpets of bats on the ceilings of caves, it's just, it's a sight like no other. It's, it's absolutely amazing. But you can also see quite easily how that makes their populations quite vulnerable to threats. You get these large, large accumulations of bats in places. And sometimes the, even if the caves themselves aren't impacted, 
all of a sudden there's deforestation all around the cave and the bats no longer have places to go root, um, forage. Um, they might not have the connectivity that they need to get between their summer and winter colonies. So they are quite vulnerable. They're also vulnerable, of course, to cave disturbance, to changing climates. Um, and because they, they can roost in these large numbers, there's, there's a series of wildlife diseases like white nose syndrome that have unfortunately killed millions of bats, particularly um, in North America. That photography also helps us to document more about the species that we study in a less invasive way and discover some pretty neat things. This is a, a photo that I took in, in Cuba of a lacoustic Jamaican fruit bat. And you also get to know and, and understand a bit about documenting the morphological differences that you see in bats and why maybe some individuals stand out from the crowd. In caves, you get to see some of the most iconic bat species, like these the, the common vampire bats on the right there. There's a lot of myths and misconceptions about bats, of course, including the belief that, that all bats are vampires when in reality, there's only three species of bats that feed on blood, the, co the common vampire there on the right that feeds on mammal blood, and then two species that specialize in avian blood, like um, the one on the left. Now, new technologies like infrared cameras allow us to study bats in the absolute darkness of these caves, where we weren't able to do that before. So we can look at their movements, we can look at their behaviors, their life cycles, what species coexist with one another, amongst many other things. And it's really a glimpse into a very unexplored world. You can see how different the different species are. Some of those are actually carrying pups as well. And bats can carry pups even when they weigh about a third of their own weight. This one's an eco-locating bat, so you can see how it's moving its ears and its nose leaf. Just looking around and exploring the world. We can also look at bats in their roosts and how they behave. So this is a colony of horseshoe bats again. They're, they're all pregnant females um, getting ready for sunset. So this is just right around sunset and they're grooming and stretching and getting ready for a night out. We also now have technologies that allow us to study the high frequency collocation calls of bats. So what do bats sound like? Well, it really varies, but this is one of my favorites. So those are horseshoe bats that basically sound like aliens through a detector. You can also look at a bat as it echolocates. If you look at its ears and its nose leaf and how it's emitting and receiving those sounds back, and then you've got an acoustic detector that's recording that call. And the pattern of the call varies by species, and it actually tells us a lot about the bats themselves and their ecology. We now have hundreds of acoustic detectors on the market of all kinds of prices and different uses. Some of them we use as handheld detectors. Others are for static surveys. So basically setting them out and recording for a number of nights, um, like you would with a camera trap, for example, a similar sort of idea. And this will tell us a lot about relative levels of abundance of bats. You can uh, figure out your diversity, which species are coexisting and also start to look at how these things are impacted perhaps by things like land use change. Using these different technologies, we've learned that broadly bats have three types of calls um, and it's, it's very much linked to the habitats they use. So you've got constant frequency calls, sort of quasi constant frequencies. They really do come in all sorts of shapes. Um, you've got frequency modulated calls and you can actually tell a lot about what the bat is doing as well. So 
you get what we call feeding buzzes. So this is the echolocation of the call. So the bat's coming along, click, 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 click. And then it goes to catch an insect. And all of a sudden it's, it does a thrill and it goes really quick and it zones into that insect and captures it. So we can tell how often they're trying to go for those bugs and catching them. You also get to tell when they're socializing and you can hear some absolutely beautiful social calls as well. The thing about bats is really they're everywhere. And these technologies have helped us to pick that apart a bit further. And I would bet money that you've all walked right past a bat race several times in your life. Unless of course you're living in Antarctica or in the, in the hot Arctic. Even the tiniest log can be a roost. This one, for example, in Peru had a, a colony of nectar feeding bats. You also get massive trees, for example, that fall over and rot in the inside and become hollow. And those are often full of bats. So this one in particular had four different species, including these incredible um, frog eating bats. Um, and if you're interested, definitely look up there. There's lots of behavioral studies on how these, these bats hunt frogs and they can listen in and detect based on the sound of the frogs, whether they're venomous or not, which is fascinating. Bats also roost in leaves. And actually there's a few species in the neotropics that will make their own tents, um, leaf tents as we call them. So what they'll do is they'll chew along the veins of the palms in different shapes and ways to basically get it to droop down into a nice little tent that protects them from the wind and the rain. Um, and yeah, the, this basically allows them to move around quite a bit. So because they're fruit eating bats, they eat seasonal fruits that are all, are all over the rainforest. So some species will actually make their tents, a little set up tent right next to their food, which sounds pretty fantastic. Imagine if you could just constantly move to your favorite restaurants every now and then. You get some bats in all kinds of leaves. So these are Honduran white bats, an absolutely beautiful little creature. They're tiny, they're about the size of a cotton ball. Um, and just in that leaf there, you had a, a little roost of them. You also get bats in all kinds of trees and cavities. Um, sometimes even if, even if they're low down, it doesn't take much to take to have bats in there. But this one had a hollow that was about 10 meters up um, and it was a, a mixed roost of two different bat species, again in Northern Peru. We also use endoscope cameras. So these are just little camera, basically a cable that has a camera on the end. And this allows us to inspect little crevices that bats might be dwelling in and do things like inspect bat boxes. So this is looking into a bat box. Um, this is in, in Ebro Delta in Spain. You can actually see the young babies of the bats, so the nice little pink ones. Um, and you can look at things like reproductive success, the sizes of the colonies, um, how they grow over time, when they're ready to fly, all sorts of things from, from using these technologies and these cameras. You can also look into trees, so places that you might not be able to look into otherwise. There he is, the bat at the end of the tunnel. Pretty remarkable. Another way to survey bats is using thermal imaging. Um, so with thermal imaging, we can, we can look at things like roost locations um, and we can study how, how the bats are using those roosts, what kind of numbers and all kinds of things as well. So here you've got some bats coming out of a tree. So you can look at things at what time they emerge, what time they're coming back. And, and do all kinds of studies on their behavior. Similarly, you can use infrared cameras to look at things like how bats are using buildings or what time they're emerging. So here you've got brown long-eared bats poking out of the gable end of a building um, not too far from north of London. Um, and you can see them there popping out. Very beautiful bats, very quiet. And actually on the other side of that same building, you get these serotine bats that are also coming out. So this, this, um, these infrared cameras record in the absolute darkness. 
which is quite amazing. This is an um, artificial roost that was built for bats in Ebro Delta in Spain. This is Angolan free-tailed bats emerging from their roost in Zambia. And they just started coming out in the hundreds. It was, it was like nothing I'd ever seen. You, get, you can see also bats, these are bats coming back into their roost. And they're actually just using these, these wooden planks on the side of a building um, and they're coming back at dawn. So this is filming them at the end of their night out just as they're coming home for a snooze. If you're interested in thermal imaging, there has actually recently been the new release of the, the bat survey guidelines for thermal imaging um, by, by Kaylee Fawcett-Williams and BCT here in the UK. We also look at traditional techniques for studying bats that include trapping. So we use mist nets, similar to what you'd, you would use with bats. And we use tarp traps like the one on the right. So those are different forms to trap bats. And this, of course, tells us lots about them as well. We can figure out what kinds of numbers are occurring, what bats are species, what bat species are, are, are co-occurring. So here's a photo actually of all six breeding myota species in the UK that were captured together at a swarming site in England. Sometimes with bats, like fruit bats, you'll catch them and they'll be carrying their fruit. So that tells us a bit about what they're foraging on and, and what kind of seeds they could be dispersing. Get bats that are covered in pollen, which is amazing. Um, bats are actually responsible for pollinating lots of the fruits that we love, like mangoes and bananas and all kinds. And they really just get in there and cover themselves in pollen. So they're fantastic pollinators. Some of the coolest trapping nights I've had have been in London. So across the UK, there's an ongoing ringing study. So you can see a little ring on the forearm of that bat. Um, and one day in, in August, I think 2017, we caught this Nathusius pipistrel that had flown all the way from Latvia just in a matter of days. And so we added a couple of records there. That was that bat, Latvia to London. Um, and actually a couple of weeks later, we caught a second bat that had flown from Latvia to London. So we're starting to, to put together those migration patterns as well. Finally, just to wrap it up, um, there's, there's thousands of technologies, but another really neat one is radio tracking of bats. So what you can do is actually put a tiny little tag on the bat that emits a signal that you can hear there with a beep. So the bat's got a tiny little tag on its bat that connects to an antenna, and the antenna then emits back to the receiver. And you'll hear those beeps. The closer you are to the bat, the stronger the beeps. Um, and then what you can do is use antennas to, to try and find them in the, whether it is to find their roosts. So you can try and pinpoint where those are, or you can see how they're using the habitats by basically looking at, at the sound of those beeps and the directionality in all kinds. So this is revealing a lot about bats and how they use the different habitats and landscapes and what's important for their conservation as well. Now I could talk about bats and technology all day long, um, but unfortunately I don't have the time this time around. Um, but basically bats, there's, it's a whole new world out there. Um, there's so much that we still need to know and it also means that you get to try out lots of different technologies, study them, even when, when it seems like, you know, they're in complete darkness. There's so much that we don't know about them. So it's an absolutely fascinating place. And we definitely need more bat biologists. So hopefully I've inspired you all to look into it a bit further. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. And I do try and share a lot more about bats on my social media as well. Um, so I hope to hear from you soon and just let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Cecilia, what fun was that? And so if you want to come out of screen share, have a bit of a conversation with us, turn that camera back on. We'd love to have a, a few questions for you. Uh, what a beautiful beginning to our global biofest. And so, yes, I mean, one of the things that really jumps out for me is when I was a kid, you know, I was in love with bats, David Attenborough. <laughs> oh, there you are, you're back. Um, 
And so I, I, I was in love with these animals from a very early age, and I went on bat walks here in Toronto. Is this something that you see in the UK, around the world? Are there opportunities for people to go and actually engage with bats personally? Because I think it's a really nice first step to growing to, to not fear them and to, to like them the way that you do. Absolutely, yes. Um, I think if you're interested in learning more about bats, join your local bat groups. There's some that are internationally focused, like Bat Conservation International. You've got some that are regional or country specific. Here in the UK, we've got lots. And they'll often do bat walks or look to your na national parks. Um, there's lots and lots of places that will lead bat walks that will take you out, teach you a little bit about the bats that you have in your different habitats just around your corner. And you'll be surprised even in cities, um, you get loads and loads of bat life out there. So I encourage you all to check it out, check out um, the different groups that are working on them around the world. Um, donate if you can and, yep. and and get out there. It's a great activity also for any age. So I often take my nephews out and they absolutely love it with their bat detectors and they can um, figure out what, what species are just around their home. Yeah, it's the coolest thing with bat detectors too because it's not like you know going out in search of other wildlife. You actually get to use this cool technology <laughs> to do it as well, sort of the theme of your talk, but a really, really neat opportunity for kids especially. Um, Cecilia, you mentioned something early on in your talk, which is white nose syndrome, and I know we don't have the time to go into that in real detail, but to my understanding, this is one of the things that's wiping out bats on a pretty monumental scale, at least here in North America. Is there a, a hope of turning the corner on this? Is there work being done to try and mitigate this as an, an issue for bats? Yeah, uh, well, I think with, with any of these wildlife diseases, the main thing that we all need to be thinking about is our biosecurity. So. They're basically fungal pathogens that have been moved around the world by humans. So it's the same case with amphibians, for example, with chytrid fungus that occurred in some areas and then humans moving from one place or another are basically taking them without realizing. So um, bats, amphibians, they've been suffering their own pandemic for years. That's been wiping out hundreds to thousands and some species have gone completely extinct. Um, so it's very important that we keep that in mind in the UK and in Europe in general, there hasn't been an impact um, of white nose syndrome. It's mainly in North America. And I know that there's a lot of conservation groups that have been looking into it and, and lots of universities that are also doing incredible research. I don't know much more on the specifics of the disease. Unfortunately, I've never um, come across it myself. Um, but I think that the important message for anyone that's listening out there is to think about these things. And actually when we are going from one continent to another and you're going into a cave you know, wipe your shoes down, disinfect your stuff before you go to another part of the world um, to investigate your wildlife. So just make sure that we're keeping them safe. I think that is hopefully one of the lessons that we'll all take home from COVID, that just like we are being careful with transmitting stuff between ourselves, we need to be careful with animals as well. It's a really great analogy, and I think, you know, a lot of our audience today, a lot of our speakers today are real world travelers, and so there's places in the world like Hawaii, like Australia, that have had difficulties with invasive species before, that have really strict quarantine measures when you come in to make sure that you're not spreading these things and pathogens and other wildlife that could impact these really delicate environments and species. So I, I think that's an important message when we're going to be coming back to a lot throughout the festival. Uh, Cecilia, time for one more question. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, <laughs> How can people at home help protect bats? We talked about building awareness for them, getting engaged with them. Is there any specific thing that you'd recommend that people can do anywhere in the world they might be tuning in from to help protect bat species near them? Oh, there's loads of stuff that you can do. I think the main thing is just making sure that their food resources are there. So um, it's all connected in the world of biodiversity, as I'm sure we'll learn over this weekend and throughout you know, all the talks. Um, if you can, you know, plant some good flowers in your garden that will attract insects, that will go a go long, long way. So about 70% of the species on earth are insect eating bats. In places like Canada, um, in, in, in Europe, all species are insectivorous bats. Um, so they are depending on, on good numbers of insects. So anything that you can do to help that um, preserve water courses, preserve the habitat around you is very, very important for bats. You can also look into setting out a bat box if you've got a nice little garden. So that'll give them a nice place to roost. And there's lots of resources. I recommend you look into Bat Conservation International, Bat Conservation Trust. They have resources online that you can check out that will have all kinds of guides on how you can create a more friendly environment for bats and really all other wildlife. They're all linked, bats, birds, insects. It all comes together, which is quite fantastic. 
What a perfect message to end our first broadcast on. Cecilia, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, you mentioned both the Conservation Trust and Conservation International, so I'll bring up those links again if anyone wants to find out more about those amazing organizations. Thank you so much for your very inspiring presentation, and I hope a lot of people take away a, a newfound love of bats or at least a little bit of a respect for them by the end of this. So thank you so much, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jesse, and thank you, everyone, for watching. Awesome. Thanks so much, Cecilia. And I will turn it back to Joe to continue on with our Global Biofest. So thank you so, so much. And